welcome everyone to tonight's or today's meeting of this series living with machines it's the second meeting um, i'm very happy today to welcome to colleagues and also to in fact have been offered the chance of uh, presenting some of my own work now my name is Sebastian, Sebastian Sunday Grave. I'm an assistant professor in philosophy at Peking University. And I will be your moderator and I will also be the first speaker. This, if you can see the screen I'm sharing with you, is our program today. So you have the presenters there on the right and also on the left, but on the right, that's what I can read. There's myself, and then there's author and researcher, Dr. Hao Jing Fang. And there's also my colleague in the philosophy department at Peking University, Professor Wu Tianyue. We will speak today in this order. Each of us will give short presentations, and it'll be in this, in this order. As you can see, all of us have been fellows at the Berggrün Institute, in particular the China Center, the research center at Peking University at some time or other. So I think I can speak for all of us to say many thanks to the Institute and the Center for their support of our research and in particular of today's meeting. The meeting, again, um, is one in the series Living with Machines, the subtitle is future perspectives and analysis. That's what it says there on the left. Uh, I don't think we actually have the title in English, but I've just given it to you again. Now, the agenda for today is this. I will try to get through these opening remarks so that I can speak to the question that is the title of my presentation today, Can Machines Be Conscious? Then there will be Hao Jing Feng, the title of her presentation is The Possibility of Realizing Digital Personality and the Imagination of the Future. Wu Tianyue will speak to a similar question as the first one concerning something machines can be or do or not. The question is, can machines be persons? In each case, we will give a short presentation, then there will be time for discussion, and we will move on to the next presentation. If we do all right on time, and I think that we can manage to do so, there will be extra open discussion at the end until 8.30 Beijing time. The discussion will mostly draw on questions, contributions that we receive on the live stream platform Billy Billy. Now this is all that I wish to say for now. I'll give a few more um, introductions as appropriate to each speaker when they give their presentation. So I should start with myself, perhaps I've already said um, that I'm working at Peking University in philosophy. My project whilst I was a fellow at the Berggren Institute concerned the philosophy of artificial intelligence, which is what I want to talk about today. Uh, a special interest that I have in this field is the work of Ellen Turing, who I believe not only helped with the theoretical computer science at the foundation of computer science as we know it, and still today, um, as well as the engineering, but I think that his philosophy of artificial intelligence still has much more to offer than um, has been appreciated uh, today. So now I don't want to talk too much about Alan Turing today, but I will say one thing in introducing my question. And at the same time, I want to talk about the poster, which I do not know who prepared for this event today. And I think it's really very fitting. Now we don't only have Mm, scientists or engineers here working 
on or around what seems to be some gigantic uh, robot. But that robot is also shown to be as what we would, I think, naturally describe as crying. And indeed, I think that we find it on one hand quite natural to ascribe all kinds of mental properties to non-human beings. There has been a time, of course, when people had difficulties, more difficulties doing so, even when it comes to animals. And many people still have such great difficulties today. But at the same time, it seems to me that it has become quite natural to speak not only of smartphones, but also all kinds of artificially intelligent technologies. And indeed, I think Turing was right when he said 70 years ago that 50 years later, one would not necessarily have to expect to be contradicted if one spoke in terms of machines that think. Nowadays, if we're waiting for a computer to process something, we might describe that as the computer still thinking about it. Um, we talk about machine learning. We find that quite natural. But at the same time, it seems equally natural that if anyone is pressed on this kind of issue, most people will admit that there's a difference. Most people would describe this difference, I think, in terms similar to, to the following. They might say, well, um, yes, we do a lot of research in machine learning, and it seems right that we call it machine learning. But at the same time, of course, machines do not learn like humans do. And more importantly, most people would find it um, easy to agree that it seems unlikely that computers or machines ever will be able to learn just like humans do. And it seems to me that most people would be inclined to say the same sort of thing about all kinds of mental properties that we might in some sense ascribe to machines or computers, but at the same time, we want to say that we're at least not sure whether they'll ever be able to have precisely the same thing as humans do. There's being sad or crying as this machine, this robot is depicted as being we would say that, well, it might simulate extremely well crying, being sad, and so on. But we want to say something must be missing. It can simulate it as well as possible, in the best possible way. And yet we want to say that it'll never experience exactly what it is that we experience when we are sad. And this, many people would generalize in terms of consciousness, phenomenal consciousness, as it is often specified. That seems to be what many people think will forever be missing from machines and robots. And it is something that distinguishes, many people think, the human from all other animals or non-animate beings. So this question, can machines be conscious, I want to, to address. Because of its importance in theoretical terms, but also because many people think when it comes to questions of morality, consciousness plays an important role. And I think that we will be able to talk about that more in the discussion. So I will focus on theoretical questions. Here's an overview of what I want to do. The question, as you know, is can machines be conscious? Now I want to give an answer, suggest a way of answering it in three steps. The first one is understanding the question. The second step will be to look at some science and engineering, some recent results in particular that I believe are useful in this particular way in which I want to suggest we might usefully answer that question. Step three will be a thought experiment on the basis of what I will have said. Um, up to that point. And this thought experiment by that point should make it relatively um, intuitive to, to give a positive answer to the question. So I begin with 
step one, understanding the question. There are two terms in this question, which require attention mostly. There's machines and there's consciousness. And being a philosopher, the way I would want to ask this question is in this most general way of what is a machine? What is consciousness? And asking it in this way uh, is likely to give you an impression of just how much disagreement there might be in um, science and uh, philosophy about these issues. Surely there are various definitions of machines that we could work with. Turing gave one in terms of what then was a new technology, namely the type of electronic digital computer that is the type of computer at the basis of all of the computing technology that we normally use nowadays. Um, he had to explain that, but I think that we can do without that. Indeed, what I want to do, not only when it comes to the question of what is a machine, but also when it comes to that of what is consciousness, is to draw merely on the familiarity that we have with these phenomena. In the case of consciousness, one reason why it seems so very mysterious to many people who have tried to give a general answer to the question what it is, is that on the one hand, it is so very familiar to us. It seems that it is perhaps the one thing that is most familiar to us, where at the same time, we struggle the most to explain it. We are all familiar with, just as it is often put, what it's like to experience something. The special quality that subjective experience has to each and every one of us. When I touch this computer in front of me now, there's a special quality to that experience. And we can at the same time say, as I have before, that that special quality of experience seems to be precisely what so many of us are inclined to say is something that the best possible robot we can imagine would seem to forever lack. Now, I want to say our pre-theoretical understanding is enough. If we can agree that that machine in front of me and the machine in front of you is indeed a machine, and we can agree that it's not conscious, I suppose that this will be true for all of us. And at the same time, we can agree that we ourselves, we are not machines, we are conscious, however, then that is all we need. If we understand that much about these two words, we understand enough to proceed to step two. So I'm going to give you one example of um, some recent research that I think is, is a good example for the kind of argument that I'm trying to present. There are many other examples, and I should stress that, but part of my approach here is to be concrete. So I want to look at one particular example. And the promising result that I'm giving you first, after which I'll talk a little bit more generally about three assumptions that I find in it for my argument, then I'll draw a preliminary conclusion and get to the thought experiment. But the promising result that I want to start with is this. Prosthetic limbs that are bidirectionally connected, thus enabling enhanced motor control and perception. So what does that mean? Well, um, bidirectionally connected means that you have an artificial limb, maybe an artificial hand, artificial arm, leg, foot, whatever. And there are signals going both ways, all right? And there's a particular method for prosthetic limbs that has been developed recently that enables this bidirectional connection. And on this basis, something like 
motor control and perception, which uh, happens on the basis of this functional restoration of a body part in the form of a machine. Okay. So how does this work? Well, I will try to explain this um, very briefly. The method that I'm talking about is called agonist antagonist myoneural interface. Agonist antagonist are the descriptions of or names of two types of muscles, which you have, for example, in your leg, as you can see here. And they work in such complementary ways that they will help you to understand whether your foot, for example, is raised or whether it is not raised, okay? You will know the position of your foot right now, even if you don't see it. And that is what is called proprioception, a type of perception. These muscles help you do that. Now, they are connected in such a way that when you lose your foot due to some injury, perhaps, the traditional amputation method will cut the connection and these muscles can no longer communicate in the natural normal ways in which they do. So the idea of this new surgical method is to restore this connection and on that basis to connect an electronic uh, prosthesis which in that way can restore the combined function of the agonist antagonist muscle and the foot, for example. So this is what they will do. They will connect the muscles using bone and then they will put on top of that a um, electronically controlled and uh, machine learning um, integrated prosthesis. Okay, so this is one of the researchers of this team at MIT, himself a great representative, obviously, of this kind of research because um, he wears prostheses himself. Now, when the research was done, um, it didn't look quite so, so polished. Uh, this is the actual subject at the time. And it's a below knee amputation. And so the progress was made for below knee amputation, first of all. And this man is so happy, I think, because almost immediately when he puts on this um, prosthesis, he can move his foot as if it was his own, his original foot. So he has very good motor control right from the start, which shows you that the bidirectional connection um, works extremely well, okay? Um, and if he closes his eyes, he can tell you the position of his foot too. So there's motor control and perception. Now, moving on to the assumptions that I want to draw from this research for my argument. There are three. First, this is a general one, the nervous system, our neuronal system, is constitutive of consciousness. If you lose your nervous system, um, you will lose your consciousness. Okay, so there's the brain, there's the spine, but there's also uh, the peripheral parts of the nervous system which reach out into our limbs. So that, for example, we can receive sensory uh, signals from our feet and hands and fingers. Now, the second assumption is this, conscious states include limb-based sensory experience. For example, the sensory experience I have now, moving my foot and knowing its position, is part of my current conscious state. So it is part of my consciousness. The third assumption is what we have just learned from this research, namely that sometimes prosthetic limb-based sensory experience can constitute your conscious states. This leads me to draw the preliminary conclusion that a machine will be partly constitutive of an individual's consciousness 
if their conscious states include prosthetic limb-based sensory experience, okay? So the idea is that if you have installed such a wonderful um, prosthesis, then because you will receive your limb-based sensory experience on the basis of it, and it is a machine, a machine is partly constitutive of your conscious states, hence your consciousness. Now on this basis, on this general principle, here's the thought experiment with which I will end. I will read it to you. A hundred years from now, there has been steady technological progress. At some point in this period, Ubu, while still young, began to suffer from a new disease of the nervous system. Ubu has been lucky though, insofar as new implant surgery has been available to her whenever she needed it. She has been lucky too in that the intervals between surgeries have been long enough that new parts of her nervous system could always be properly integrated thanks to various kinds of therapy as well as her system's continued neuroplasticity before another part needed to be replaced. So we are in the future. Technology has made some progress such that someone with a nervous system disease where the nervous system needs to be restored and replaced continuously can actually have their nervous system restored in this way. And we can think of this disease to begin in the periphery and perhaps to move further closer to the central nervous system, perhaps the brain. But there's a question as to whether we need to take it this far because the new idea of this approach is not to ask ourselves, how are we going to engineer consciousness? How are we going to um, build a robot and give it consciousness? That's not the idea. Rather, what we do is we take something of which we know that it's conscious and we reapply a method of restoring part of what constitutes its consciousness, namely its nervous system. And so we start, for example, with a prosthesis for the foot and we continue with the leg and so on. So we apply a method of which we know that consciousness can be retained, but more and more machine parts will be added such that if you look at the percentage of human and machine you have, the machine will grow as it were. Some people will think that this is never going to prove anything unless um, there is no human part left. Others will think that that is not quite necessary. But the conclusion I want to draw is a principle. The principle is this, the nervous system can be replaced by alternate parts of a different material so that a human may slowly be turned into a machine whilst retaining consciousness. Perhaps we want to say that they are not no longer human at all, but I think there will be a case to say that what we have is a kind of machine and it is conscious because it is continuous with something about which we have always agreed that it was conscious to start with. That's the argument. Thanks very much. Now, being the moderator myself, I should say, thanks indeed. Um, and I hope it's okay that I perhaps went a little bit over time. Now, I know there will be some questions and perhaps some contributions that will be shared with me by my colleague, Kian Yu for the discussion. Are there any, any questions or perhaps rebuttals? 
of my argument, can you? Oh, you, you mean you're asking from, from me? Oh. Well, uh, no, not necessarily. Ah, okay, uh, so because since I have not seen uh, any question from, from our audience yet, so maybe I can ask a question first. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, um, so uh, I think the the thought experiment you mentioned uh, is quite like the traditional thought experiment of Seishu's ship. So when you replace a part of the ship, and uh, 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 will the ship remain the same one? So I think uh, if you want to uh, reach your conclusion, probably we also need to uh, assume some sort of uh, identity of the person uh, of Fubu, as you mentioned, um, when some parts of uh, his or her uh, neurological parts have been replaced by machines. So I, I would like to hear your comments about the, uh, the identity of bubbles uh, through the times, through times, yeah. That's right. That's indeed one possible objection to what I mentioned was part of the strength of the argument as I see it, namely the supposed continuity yeah. of something of which we said that it was conscious, which could be any one of us. We take some conscious human being and we apply the method of which I introduce an example such that we can restore part of the nervous system using machine parts. And the question now is, if we continue to do this, perhaps, and we do it as in the case of Theseus' ship, such that we could even, uh, I think this is, this is perhaps a less realistic thought experiment, but we could even um, rebuild the original person, right? But I think that in, in the case of Theseus' ship, this works very well. In the case of the person, this, this doesn't work well. But the question still arises whether this continuity of identity can be, um, can be maintained. However, I would say, I would at least not exclude the possibility that there can be continuity of consciousness without continuity of identity. Now, there are, of course, uh, theories about identity in terms of consciousness, such that the idea is the continuity of consciousness is precisely what constitutes personal identity. But I am not married to, to that claim. So that I could agree, perhaps, if someone said, yes, um, we will have something that is conscious, um, and that something will have a considerable amount of machine parts, so that perhaps we want to say, um, that's a conscious machine, but maybe it's no longer the human being that it originally was. I would be happy to agree with that. But then, and I think this is the problem, Someone might say, but your argument was based on the continuity of our knowing that the person is conscious. Now, you no longer have the person. So you no longer have that guarantee of consciousness that you originally introduced, right? I think this is, this is the crux of the question about identity. And that's... That's a difficult question, which I think can be answered, but an answer will require uh, a much more elaborate um, proposal than what I have time for now. But it's a, it's a good and important question that I know I, I will face. So thank you. Okay, thank you, it, it helps a lot. And uh, now we have one question from the audience. Uh, can we have a better standard for defining consciousness, or at least try to make progress. In particular, in the debates of AI, I'm often frustrated by the misuse of consciousness. So 
mind, intelligence, personality, awareness, etc. How would you distinguish between them? And what do you rank as the primary factor when thinking about the future of machines? So it's a long mm -hmm. question. <laughs> it's, it's a long and complicated question, but I can see that um, the, com the, the connections of the different parts. So this person raises the issue of the lack of clear, precise definitions of many or perhaps all of the vocabulary that is frequently applied to machines when we talk about um, AI, when we talk about the future of machines and robots. And well, I share that frustration at the lack of precision that our concepts have, and perhaps also the lack of precision that we often find in the accounts that even experts give us concerning these things. Now, I think the best thing we can do is to try and work hard to offer more precise terms. How are we going to do that? Now, my, appro my approach is bottom-up, you could say, rather than um, top-down. So top-down would be, we want to know whether machines can be conscious. So let's figure out what consciousness is. And once we know, we should be able to infer whether machines can have it or not, right? The only problem with consciousness, but indeed with all of the other mental properties that were mentioned, awareness, intelligence, and so on, is that people have tried for thousands of years to figure out what those things are. And um, most people agree only on one thing, which is that uh, no one has really figured it out. Anyway, there is no agreement. And so it seems to me quite hopeless to say, let's get to these questions when we have a better understanding of the fundamental notions. I think that there's one reason we cannot do this, and that is that there's a practical urgency to solve these problems. Because whilst Turing thought it would be possible to make conscious machines, he thought it would be, as he said, idiotic. He thought that no one wants that. There's no point. But I think he was wrong about this. And I can say it this way, perhaps this is the last thing for which I, I have time, then we we'll move on. It seems to me that machines, often in the form of robots now, but also digitally, purely digitally, non-physically, like apps, you think um, of, uh, in particular, care robots and so on, um, these machines are beginning and have already begun to take the place of humans. And I think that it will continue to be this way because there are people who prefer interaction with computers or machines over interaction with humans. And there are good reasons for such a preference. I'm not saying that we should all and only do that sort of interaction and, and, and stop interacting with human beings, but it is obvious that there's value in interacting with something that can be programmed to be as good as possible and to be only intent on being as good as possible for you in the specific way in which you want your world to work, okay? You can have a friend who is a computer program to be the best friend you could possibly have. Maybe you think that's somehow impossible, but many people, if they are offered this by a business, will want to try it out. So I think if conscious machines were offered to people, they would buy it. And so there is business, therefore there is demand, there is also theoretical interest on the side of us and also scientists and engineers. And so there will be research funding. 
And therefore, I have no doubt that these things will be developed or people will try to develop it, even if they don't know yet whether it's really possible. So things will pop up, sometimes surprisingly, not tomorrow, but perhaps sooner than we think. And so we can't wait for the theory. I think we have to develop theories in a way that is of practical use. Hence, I'm trying to provide a better way of answering this question on the basis of things that we can agree on and to avoid first having to develop theories of these difficult notions such as consciousness and intelligence and so on. That's the idea. It was a long question. It was a long answer. <laughs> thanks. Okay. Thanks for the question. Yeah, I think we should move to the second yeah. speaker. Yeah. Yes, let, let, us, let us move on. We will now hear the presentation by Dr. Hao Jing Fang. And I mentioned her title earlier, but I also know that she, she may have decided to speak about something else. Do you, Jing Fang, let me ask, do you, do you want to share your screen? Yeah, okay. Yeah, Great. yes. Whilst you're doing that, I will briefly introduce you. Yeah. Dr. Hao Jing Fang graduated from Tsinghua University with an undergraduate degree in physics, and she later gained her PhD degree in economics and management, also from Tsinghua. And she has worked as deputy director of research in China Development Research Foundation from 2013 to 2018. She was also a visiting fellow at Harvard Kennedy School in 2018. She has engaged in many research projects and her research projects during those years include the coordination of big city groups in China, the rise and fall of great nations, the labor market in the era of artificial intelligence and the structure of research and innovation in China. And there are more. Hao Jing Feng started to write novels in 2006, and she won the Best Novelette Prize, the Hugo Award, for her short story, Folding Beijing, at the 74th World Science Fiction Convention. So today, she will speak to us about her work on artificial intelligence in the broadest possible sense. So welcome. Hi, hi everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to share some of my thoughts with you on this issue. And actually, I would like to echo a little bit on the previous uh, speaker Sebastian's uh, talk and also about his uh, mental uh, experiment. It's a wonderful, wonderful mental experiment. Uh, however, I think there are two questions that I can ask about this. Uh, uh, the, this mental experiment. The first one is that um, if you substitute the neuron uh, of human brain, um, can you believe that uh, a human can still survive uh, if a, lot, a large part of uh, his or her brain is substituted by some other materials. I am very suspicious on this. I suppose that when you substitute some of those neurons with like metal or other materials, um, sooner or later, this person will die. <laughs> I'm not sure whether this, this is true or not. Perhaps some neural um, scientists or some, um, some, some doctors can answer this question, but I'm not sure about this. So if you substitute some of those neurons uh, um, by some other materials, so, and then um, it's very difficult for the brain to still survive in that, in, in that situation. So um, we, we need an, a real experiment on this. However, it's not very humane <laughs> to do this experiment. Um, Another question is that we can do a um, um, 
another experiment very similar to this. I, oh, I always have a question that uh, if you let alpha go to uh, play chess with a uh, human, it will do it. But so when, if you let the light alpha go to play chess with human, and it says, no, I don't want to do it. Then we can say it has the consciousness. It can has the free will to make a decision for itself. But will it? Right now at this moment, alpha go, alpha zero, alpha what, what, what? All those AIs will not say no to the, uh, to, to the developer. It only can obey the um, order of the developer. Um, so at this moment, however smart, however um, intelligent these AIs are, if they cannot say no, if they cannot refuse the developer, it will not, it does not have the consciousness and uh, uh, we can't see whether it can. Uh, but sometimes if the developer give the um, uh, AlphaGo as uh, um, option, an option and tells it when you face this uh, situation, you can say yes. When you face or the other situation, you can say no. If else, uh, if they give those uh, uh, code to the uh, AI, perhaps uh, at some point, this AI will um, recognize the situation and make the choice yes or no. It's a, a decision-making um, uh, process. And if the decision-making process is complicated enough, and it will have a lot of yes or no, yes or no um, options in its code. And maybe at some point, this AlphaGo will be complicated enough to face all those, uh, those situations and decide whether it would like to play chess today or whether it would like to play computer games today. So, and that's and also a an, uh, mental experiment that we can give those choices into the uh, program of the AIs and let those choices to develop by itself and in the complicated situation. So then perhaps a long uh, time later, these AIs can make decision in all the occasions by itself. And then perhaps those AIs can think like human. And uh, that's one of my mental experiments when I hear the talk of Sebastian. So mm, I'm not sure whether we can try it out. Today, I would like to uh, talk about some lives in 50 years later. Uh, the fir at first, I, I'd hope to talk about um, digital, digital personality, but now I think that uh, I would like to talk also about some other aspect of life of, in 50 years later. So I think that uh, 50 years later, we will live with the artificial intelligence uh, together in all the aspects of life. Um, in everyday life, your AI assistant will help you in a lot of places. Uh, it will book the uh, hotels and flights for you. It will make the timetable for you. It can answer your uh, question about um, when I, when I, who should I meet today? Where should I go today? Uh, what should I take with me today? Because AI at that time uh, will catch up those uh, keywords in your conversation with people and will help you to make memorize, memorizations of all the things you need to do and help you to prepare all the stuff you uh, necessary. When you feel sick, maybe your uh, boyfriend is not by your side, but the AI can let the hot water machine to make a cup of hot water for you. So I think that 50 years later, um, whether uh, we, we will live with AI together, um, 
even if it has not consciousness, but it can uh, definitely help us uh, support us in life. So that's the first point I I have. We will live with the artificial intelligence together, and we will rely our lives on the artificial intelligence. And we uh, one thing I would also like to suggest is that um, uh, the human machine interaction will be so so. Um, uh, regular at that time, uh, because at that time, perhaps all, all of us will have some kind of uh, um, chips inside our brain or just outside our uh, head. And those uh, chips can catch up some of those uh, uh, signals thought of us and send to um, send by Wi-Fi to some other machines, uh, such as when we uh, walk uh, across a shop and we see something and we feel, oh, it's so nice. And these kind of uh, signals will send to the, uh, uh, sent to a machine and uh, uh, it will, those things will come into our mobile phone or other things. So we will uh, be very used to the interaction of our mind with machine. At some point, I think that's very scary because my thought, if my thought is scanned by machines, oh, I have no privacy at that time. But, but actually, humans are very, very adaptive. Now we are adaptive to our mobile phones. We send um, all the messages on the internet. And actually on internet, our messages are scanned by a lot of super AIs. If we uh, look into a news and we like the news, then the super AI will send us more news on this issue. So uh, people are very happy to see this. Uh, that's, that's why I think maybe people are also at, adaptive to the uh, human mind and the machine interaction in the future. And also, I think that the virtual reality in the future will be um, really important in our life because now uh, this year, the concept of metaverse is very, very popular now in, in China. A lot of people are talking about metaverse, uh, how we will live in metaverse uh, in, in the future. And I know that also Facebook, in Facebook, uh, Zuckerberg also um, think that metaverse is the future and Facebook will all in in metaverse. If we all have um, digital personality in metaverse, uh, and this this uh, per digital personality can do a lot of things uh, in representative me, and perhaps that um, it's very difficult to distinguish a human and a machine, because I know one of my friends, uh, Zeng Yi, he has developed um um new kind of new type of AI. He scanned the brain, the neural links of the little mouse and little, little monkey. And he used that scanning to develop a new kind of uh, um, AI, very, very similar to the neural network of um, a creature. And then that um, AI program showed a lot of uh, similarities to the human brain. So if in the future, um, the brain machine interaction is so, so well developed, then we can scan all our neural, uh, neural link and uh, record that data in the machine system. And we can uh, develop a um, brain program of ourselves. And that program, that super AI can really make decisions like us. And uh, that program can respond to a lot of uh, um, simple questions, just as how we respond to that, those questions. Then we can sign, um, uh, um, we can let it to be uh, our representative to attend some of those meetings 
and to uh, talk to people or to uh, buy things for us because i we trust that these uh, ai these uh, neuralink ais are just so similar to my own brain and we trust that it will uh, speak to people or make the uh, right decision just as I do. And then we can give that uh, brain AI program um, an appearance <laughs> uh, in, in the metaverse. And then that program can just work in the metaverse and talk to people in metaverse, just like I'm living in those digital world. So at that time, um, it's really difficult to say that uh, uh, whether that digital person is me or a machine. So it, it may be one of the bridge between a human and, uh, and a machine. I think that kind of digital representative will become true in the future because a lot of um, um, technology is uh, nearly ready at now at this point. So 50 years later, these kind of uh, digital human <laughs> will live in metaverse just like we do in the reality. And then we have a lot of new technologies the developing now uh, and i believe that in my life we can see uh, the um, average age of human become 100 years old or more and then perhaps we will be healthy still in our 90s 80s and 90s even in our hundreds so at that long, long time, uh, we can experience a lot of uh, development of technology. Um, perhaps uh, I, I'm, I'm still doubt that whether we can change our real neural uh, neural link. But I, during that time, we can record a lot of our uh, thoughts and memories, and we can make a lot of interactions. Uh, uh, from us uh, to the machines, and then we can train our digital personality with a lot of um, uh, new data, new memory. And after we finally die some, uh, some years later, and maybe our digital personality can live in the future, um, just like we have uh, forever, uh, forever li life. And uh, uh, this year, I published this new book with Bogurin Institute. So you can see uh, the Bogurin uh, sign here. And this book is called China Frontier. Uh, let's ask the scientists. I asked um, 10 scientists in 10 different areas in China. In, we, I asked uh, uh, scholars developing artificial intelligence and the uh, uh, brain machine interaction and also the spaceship exploration and uh, medical care and also uh, other uh, new technologies in China and these uh, creators these um, uh, developers they are very good they are on the same uh, in, in some areas they are on the same level with the uh, researchers in the western world so um, a lot of them describe a new future for all the human beings and i got the ideas from them so in the future we need to uh, ask a lot of questions in the business model as well so uh, i will go over this really very, very quickly because, um, yeah, um, because we need to answer a lot of questions that uh, who define the digital world in the future. If we have that such kind of uh, digital information, whether it should be shared freely or whether it, it is still the asset or resources that need to be uh, priced and purchased if we have those kind of uh, digital person personality in the metaverse 
whether this metaverse, this digital world is a, a new kind of utopian or dystopian. So these kind of things are very intriguing in now this world because, uh, uh, because these uh, things, these new concepts and um, uh, things are so, so intriguing. And um, um, now the boundary between human and, um, uh, and, and the digital world, between human and machine is so vague that I, I think perhaps uh, uh, in just 10 years, we will not distinguish, we will not discuss the uh, relationship between human and machine, but we will discuss a lot of uh, um, interaction of human and machine that we cannot really say uh, which part is belong belongs to human, which part belongs to machine, but we live in a real world um combining human and machine because we human will put our uh, memories our thoughts our um, uh, our personality in the digital world and also machine will copy will scan our uh, mind will interact with our brain so that the machine will just uh, act as we do so then it's a kind of a human machine world. And then who will define the uh, rule of this world? Who will be the regulator of this world? Whether this world is a, a free digital world or whether this world is just like the reality uh, in which everything is priced and you, you need to purchase everything. So those questions are most attractive to me at this moment. Um, uh, so I won't uh, escape this, the final part, because this part is about some space exploration. Um, yeah, but uh, actually, I would like to say that um, in my mind, now, in the future, we will not um, human and the digital human and machine will live combined together um, with a lot of uh, interactions and the digital um a lot of digital human living in a digital world in the future i'm quite i i i am quite convincing of this future and hope to discuss with you about uh, all the aspects and the perspective of this future okay that's my talk Mama, Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jingfang, for, for your presentation. We're also excited to talk about this, this about the future with you. Now, let me just see whether we have already coming in questions from our audience. Okay, I think they they are just coming in. Mm, I was I can ask a very small question, uh, and perhaps it's it's also a, a small answer. Mm, you know that in artificial intelligence there is a reputation that um, I think the AI researchers are not very proud of, which is that. Too many of them have made predictions as to what is going to be happening in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. I think 50 years is a relatively popular number to, to use. I wondered whether, because um, you have thought about these things for a long time and you have also spoken to many experts, whether you have reasons to say, this is what you expect in 50 years, rather than this is what you expect in 100 years or 150? Um, the, the reason that I think 50 years is reasonable is that so when I talk to some scientists who is now doing those uh, scanning works of our neuro neuron network about um, uh, try to understand all those uh, um, electricity and all the magnetic electrical magnetic waves from our brain uh, when 
now um, this field is very hot and the people made a lot of progress on this. Um, although uh, people can only, um, only explain uh, some really simple uh, uh, signals now, but I think this, this area has developed very fast in the past 10 years. And one of my friends is now using some um, quantum equipment to scan our brain and to try to um, scan those uh, magnetic wave uh, signals from our brain. And I think that uh, in about maybe 20 or 30 years and those scan will be quite accurate and then people can uh, understand those uh, neuron neural network um, with much more precision in next 10 or 20 in 20 years and then even if that um, the uh, scientists cannot understand all the electrical uh, signals it can just um, make um, 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 just make a representative brain in the digital world. And I see my friend uh, Zeng Yi who has made a, a, a digital brain uh, AI program, just uh, like a, a brain of a little mouse. And that uh, AI, AI brain can, can do a lot of things and can uh, let a little robot to recognize itself in the mirror. So I think that's a very, very large development. Uh, in, in the future, uh, I think that in 50 years, this kind of technology can be very developed and uh, I can have a digital me in the digital world. It's very possible. Yes, thanks very much for that answer. Uh, it makes it particularly exciting, of course, this possibility to think that this should be something that will happen within the lifetime of many of us. So thanks very much for, for explaining it. Now I have one question here uh, from our audience. It's relatively long, so I will read it out for you. The nature of the metaverse does not seem to be a new idea philosophically. If we agree that the universe is computable and probably sometime in the future, we will be capable of digital universe building. Has it already happened without us realizing it? There's more. Philosopher Nick Bolstrom, once famously investigated the possibility that we may already be living in a computer simulation. In his arguments, a vital premise is that an advanced civilization would like to run simulations. The creation of metaverse seems to prove this account. That's the question. Yes, actually, I do uh, agree with him. Um, in my new long novel called uh, The Universe Jumpers or Yu Zhou Yue Tian Zhe, um, I just developed this idea that uh, our universe is actually a digital universe. The basic, uh, in the basic uh, uh, thing is information instead of uh, materials, uh, matter or um, other things. So the information uh, really create uh, materials or matter and the information has the information uh, energy. Uh, and our brain can, uh, when we have thought, when we have those um, 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 mental, mental uh, uh, activities and then we actually create new information <laughs> and actually we can create the new uh, information energy but those information those um uh digit those um digit world is not uh, developed by some um former uh, uh for, former um aliens or things it just it is developed by the nature itself by the universe itself so when the universe 
the development of the universe is actually like a self-development um, program, a uh, 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 com computer, um, it's like a computer program. And then those computer program, those uh, information really uh, generate our, this matter, this matter world. Um, but it's self-developed, it's not developed by some alien people. We are living in that uh, digit uh, information universe. <laughs> and I, I just uh, uh, use this kind of concept in my new long novel. And uh, I do think that information is the uh, basic, the fundamental uh, uh, subsistence, subsistence in, this, in our universe. Thank, thanks so much. You spoke about your new novel and you also gave a title in English. Is it translated already? It's now in translation, also still by Ken Liu, and uh, uh, he will finish translation in the next year. Oh, I see. Okay. Something to look forward to. Very good. Um, whilst uh, we can, I think, have uh, one more question maybe from from our audience, which uh, I will I will receive, I think, in a moment. Um, but I also wanted to ask one question, if I if I may, which is about the things that we have both spoken about. That, namely, we have both said things that make us wonder about identity. I have spoken about ways in which physically our body may change. And there was a question about identity and you said at the beginning that you think when it comes to uh, replacing certain parts of our bodies, perhaps the brain, um, you do not think that um, the human can survive it. And I believe many people would agree with you about that. Nowadays, of course, there's often talk about um, digital life also in terms of uh, uploading our minds and I believe that people would hope some people would hope that they can perhaps live forever after all if they can just upload themselves into something like a metaverse so when you speak about the future of digital personality have you thought about um, the possible issues and questions of identity that that it raises yeah actually i don't think that the digital personality or the um the the um i don't think it's me uh, and i don't think i share uh, the same consciousness with this uh, digital person digital person and perhaps it this person will have its own identity. It's just like a twin of me. You know that uh, if you have a twin or clone of yourself, uh, it has the same gene with you, but uh, after that, it has a different life with you. So I think that this uh, digital person, if you have a digital personality and it's not the same as you in in the sense of consciousness you still feel that uh, uh, you you are you are yourself and that's another person but if there is uh, uh, you upload your memory and you lap, upload everything you you think precisely in that computer. And this personality will react very, very much like you. So it's just like your twin. It, it has a similar thoughts with you, is a similar habit. And uh, on the internet, when it purchased the uh, product, it has the uh, similar taste with you, but uh, you, do, you uh, definitely don't feel that uh, that's also you. It's just uh, some kind of a digital program, very similar to you. And you can let him or her to do a lot of things for you and um, yet, yeah, I think that's it, because the consciousness, uh, one of the most um, important characteristics of consciousness is the oneness or the wholeness. You can only feel that um, 
you are a whole person. You you can never feel that oh you are two, one here, one there, one in reality, one in the metaverse. No, I don't think you will feel that. You can see a meta some person in the metaverse very similar to you, but that's just it. Thanks very much. There's there's many interesting um, issues that you raise, and I, I like the way that you always uh, think about it in in some of the practical ways that you believe to see um, being developed to today, right? Uh, yeah. So I, I think we have we have one more question um, for you from from the audience. Uh, it concerns it concerns the thought experiment that uh, that I that I brought up. Um, so the question is this: If consciousness is essentially an emergent property of our biological basis, then it seems that at some point the replacing process will eliminate consciousness. Derek Parfit, the philosopher, once adopted the same approach to prove that personal identity is an illusion. And I'm not sure whether we can say that the new boo-boo is just a machine shared the psychological continuity with a former person. Do you, that's the question. Do, do, you, do you have um, something to say in response? Um, actually, I think that uh, um, if you, you are still conscious, then you will feel you are a continuity, even if you changed a lot of part uh, in, in your mind. Um, because all of us has has already changed a lot in our whole life, our memory updated every day, and uh, we have new thoughts. Our personality uh, is not the same as we were very young, but we still think that uh, it's me. It's I have only one uh, self. So the con the 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 sense of continuity. Uh, is always the most important uh, characteristic of our consciousness. We feel that I uh, am one and, uh, and the wholeness and the continuity uh, is always the, um, the uh, characteristic of personality. Um, however, I think that um, also, the, the, the sense of the new whole world is part of the um, personality <laughs> because actually, um, only not only my the, the sense of my body is uh, the is uh, a part of the personality, but also my sense of the environment around me, my sense of the other people, uh, and my memories of other people, all this constituted a whole uh, personality and my consciousness. Um, in other words, my, consci my consciousness includes everything in this world uh, that I can sense. Mm -hmm. So um, even if some part of the, the, the world changed, some part of my thoughts changed, some part of my memories changed, I still feel, oh, it's, it's a whole world uh, and I have a whole me. So I think that uh, this is still a mystery in science, how this kind of wholeness <laughs> come out. Um, yeah, uh, it's very mysterious. Yes, I think so too. Thank, thank you very much. So this, this continuity um, is something that I completely agree on, of course, and it's uh, what what I'm trying to um, to exploit in in such a way that it seems to me if we make very small changes, only very small changes, and as you know, so many things seem to be changing anyway. And as long as the unity of our consciousness continues, um, we are happy to to agree that there's also I think continuity of um, the personal identity. So 
you said that you think there's a point when you start changing certain parts of the original biological makeup of the human uh, body, right? I think most people would agree when you get to what seems to be central to our nervous system, the brain and so on, um, you would expect there's a time at which suddenly the lights go out, right? Yeah. <laughs> you, try, you try to change that. And I think, um, I think, I think that is where uh, you also, you, you agree with this um, questioner uh, concerning the importance of the, um, the, the, the material of which we are, we are made. So that's, that's very interesting. And at the same time, you think that um, there is a digital um, future in which we have something like, like twins rather yeah. than a continued life of, of our own. Yeah. Yes, two, two different notions. Very, very interesting. So thank you so much, um, Jing Fang. We will uh, move, move on to our third presentation now which of course um, is closely related to the things we have already been um, talking about. And it is now my great honor to introduce my, my colleague um, here at Peking University, Professor Wu Tianyue, who will talk to us about his latest research. Whilst he begins to share a screen, I will also take this time to briefly introduce him and his work. Uh, sorry, just just now my my machines are uh, my w w won't won't uh, help me at all. Okay, so um, one second, I, I I prepared this for you. Um, so yeah, no problem, no Wu worry. <laughs> Wu Tian Wu Tian um, graduated from uh, Catholic University. Um, in Leuven, Belgium, and he has long devoted himself to reconstructing philosophical arguments in ancient and medieval historical texts as a way of exploring new intellectual resources for current reflections. In his early days of research, Professor Wu attached great importance to the philosopher Augustine's discussion of free will and moral responsibility. And he currently focuses on the philosophy of mind and ethics, also in ancient and medieval Aristotelian traditions. He is the author of Voluntas et Libertas, a philosophical account of Augustine's conception of will in the domain of moral psychology. And this book chiefly discusses the psychological dimension of Augustine's concept of the will and adopts a philosophical perspective to explore the function of the will as a faculty of the soul. And through this lens, Professor Wu has argued, we can better understand why it is the will and not other mental activities that underlie our moral responsibilities. So today, Professor Wu is going to speak to us about the question whether machines can be persons. Welcome. Thank you a lot, uh, Sebastian, especially for organizing this workshop. And uh, I'm very happy to speak after the first uh, two speakers, because uh, Sebastian uh, talks about the possibility of changing a human person into a machine in the real world. Real world. Of course, in the in the future, in the distant future, and uh, Jin Fang uh, talks about uh, uh, the personhood in a digital world, and uh, now I will I would like to go back to our real world, and to ask whether we should recognize the personhood of a machine uh, in in the near future. Okay. So we, we have been living with machines for a long time, but it was re rare for us 
probably with the exception of philosophers to ask the question, what are machines? And uh, we were used to take it for granted that a machine is a piece of equipment with several moving parts that use power to do a particular type of work. Machines were often sought to do their jobs automatically without thinking about them at all. In light of this, it seemed weird if not ridiculous to ask further whether machines can be persons. For persons and machines appeared to belong to two entirely different categories. One could decide how to do a job and even whether the job itself should be done or not, where the, the other could only function exactly as designed to be, no matter how the system, uh, how, how complex is the system. Yeah, but I think the situation seems to change in the age of AI. Machines powered by AI are carrying out a variety of complex activities such as uh, planning tasks, making decisions in real time, interacting emotionally with human persons, which had been thought to be unique to humans before. For instance, in the imaginable future, a fully automatic car can sense its environment and make real time decisions on the road. Such an intelligent machine at least appears to be able to think and make a choice on its own. I think at least it appears to be able to do so. Today, more than ever before, we feel the need to address curious question as Sebastian already mentioned, can machines think? It is also natural for us to ask further about the practical implications of this possibility. How should we treat the AI-powered machines if they can think and make their own decision? I think no matter how we define the capacity of thinking or, um, or making decisions, we are inclined to treat things that can do so in a very special way. For we are certain that we ourselves are things that think. More than that, we, we tend to believe that thinking and making decisions are essential features that distinguish us from other beings and guarantee us a specific place in the cosmos. Whether this belief uh, can be justified is not our concern for the moment. At least the occurrence of apparently thinking machines make it sensible now to raise the question, can or should uh, uh, machines become persons like us? But before moving on, uh, let us make it explicit that we are not talking, we are not asking whether machines can be humans. Humans are biological species, homo sapiens. We are not concerned here whether there can be a biological robots that have all characteristic biological features of homo sapiens. So far as there remains the traditional boundary between the lateral and the artificial, between the inanimate and the living things, it makes little sense to ask whether machines can become uh, humans. What worries us here is rather our practical or moral attitudes to the intelligent machines mentioned above that seem able to think, make plans, delegate tasks, make decisions on their own initiatives, etc. For, for briefly, I will refer to them as thinking machines. So the problem is how should we interact with thinking machines? in our social and moral life. I think uh, the problem can be approached from two perspectives. On the one hand, we need to know if the thinking machines are therefore 
endowed with some basic rights like us, which require to be recognized and respected in any moral community. For example, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights claims, everyone has the right to life, liberty, and the security of a person. If a robot is a person, it seems to follow that it should not be killed or destroyed by another entity, including its designer, manufacturer, consumer, or even government. I, I mean, without uh, some justified uh, reasons. On the other hand, we can enjoy rights only when we fulfill our duties, such as the duty to respect every person's right to life. Accordingly, if an intelligent machine is a thinking thing and a, a agent like us, it is also obliged to fulfill its duties in a given community. If an obligation is not made, the machine will be held accountable as humans, at least as a normal adult humans. For instance, when a fully automatic car hits and kills a pedestrian because of a wrong decision in real time, the legal responsibility for compensating the victim should be attributed to the car itself. Or maybe the machine itself should be sent into a jail cell like you see in the picture. In short, what concerns us here is the moral and the legal status of thinking machines. The attitudes or reactions we mentioned can be justified only when their receivers are capable of rights and responsibilities. It seems that only a person has such a full moral status which gives her fundamental rights to be protected by law, as well as moral and legal obligations to be carried out by herself. It should be stressed again that the person in question is not necessarily a human being. This is especially true in legal contexts, since co co corporations and even non-animate objects such as the rivers have been seen as uh, legal persons in some countries. Furthermore, there are also controversies about whether animals should be recognized as persons that deserve moral considerations. I think all of these have tempted scholars of AI ethics to construct analogies to corporations and animals to argue that thinking machines can be persons as well. We may think that a robot's right to life or the legal responsibility of a self-driving car are purely distant hypothetical scenario like thought experiments, which have uh, little if any bearing on our moral and the legal practices today, at the least of today. But some placemakers did not think so. On 16 February uh, 2017, the European Parliament adopted the civil law rule on robotics, which recommended the following action, I quote, uh, creating a specific legal status for robots in the long run, so that at least the most sophisticated autonomous robots could be established as having the status of electronic persons responsible for making good any damage they may cause and possibly applying electronic personality to uh, cases where robots make autonomous decisions for otherwise in or otherwise interact with third parties independently. An important motivation of this proposal is to fascinated liability issues, including thinking machines like a self-driving car we mentioned earlier. Yeah, for according to a popular interpretation of legal personhood, its main function is nothing but to facilitate the regulation of behavior. If giving robots uh, a legal 
a person who can help us solve uh, liability issues. So we have good reasons to do so. Yeah, so, so the European Parliament was not alone to make such a bold move uh, regarding the legal status of um, thinking machines. In October of the same year, uh, Saudi Arabia granted citizenship to Sophia, a lifelike humanoid social robot. Unlike the emphasis on legal responsibility in the European Parliament uh, resolution, this decision seems to highlight the possible rights of a robot citizen, even though we, we are not clear what sort of rights they are. It seems that Sophia enjoys much more rights than an ordinary female citizen can enjoy in Saudi Arabia. Anyway, I think uh, not, but, but not a, everyone likes this idea of uh, giving personhood to a robot. In an open letter to the European uh, uh, Commission, a group of 285 uh, AI and robotics experts they they just mentioned they challenged the paragraph cited above as uh, ideological and nonsensical and non-pragmatic. I think one of the latest central ethical concerns was that the electronic personhood would entitle robots to human rights such as dignity, integrity, remuneration, or citizenship which are likely to impinge the rights of human beings. It will threaten uh, human rights in the future. We might think that the position of the, the open nature is closer to a lay person's intuition and therefore more convincing than the European Parliament's resolution. Nevertheless, I think they are also um, scholars, especially philosophers, in favor of the idea of granting both moral and legal personhood to thinking machines. Their basic idea is uh, that personhood is not an uh, inborn quality that is reserved only for a natural species like human beings, but rather something requiring recognition in a given community. So if we have good reasons to show that some thinking machines reach the threshold of personhood by satisfying its qualifying conditions, we should not hesitate to treat them as persons like us. But what are these qualifying conditions that make a being a person? In a recent contribution, uh, Gordon, uh, uh, John Stuart Gordon reviews uh, three most common theories of moral personhood, as you can see here, uh, the human dignity approach, uh, the rationality autonomy approach, and the relational approach. So let's take us a closer look at this approach. Uh, according to Gordon, the human dignity approach argues that only a being with dignity has full moral status and therefore qualifies for moral personhood. But only human beings have dignity. So it follows that thinking machines who cannot become human beings, by definition, cannot be moral persons. Uh, Gordon immediately dismisses this approach as highly questionable for its narrow-minded species. Because according to this approach, human beings are illegally put on the top of a pyramid of, uh, of values, much higher than other natural species, even though in our ecosystem, we just uh, uh, we are living on the same level, sharing the same uh, environment together. Yeah, but as I will argue later, this criticism applies to the human dignity approach, but not necessarily 
to a personal dignity approach, which endows non-human beings the dignity or inherent moral values. Okay, so we move to the second approach. Uh, rationality or autonomy approach is a very traditional uh, uh, conception of personhood, but also thought to be more promising. It takes rationality and uh, autonomy as preconditions for moral personhood. According to this approach, a moral person should be held responsible for her moral actions. But moral actions is possible only when the person uh, can decide to act in a rational or autonomous manner in accordance with uh, the moral principles she accepts. It follows that rationality, as I mentioned earlier, rationality or autonomy is a precondition of um, moral personhood. So if a machine can, can behave in a rational or autonomous way, then, pos uh, then it's possible that we, we recognize uh, this machine as a person. But there are also criticism to this approach. First, it seems uh, at least for, uh, uh, for people working on animal rights and uh, disability studies, uh, this approach seems to have uh, uh, illegally deprived animals and the mentally disabled people of moral personhood from the very beginning without argument. Yeah. Because, uh, uh, because they are not capable of some specific uh, uh, rational uh, behavior, they, they cannot be treated as personhood. And uh, it also lays an unjustified emphasis on human cognitive capacities and does not pay sufficient attention to other parts of human beings, such as emotions, or the uh, ability to experience pleasure and the pain. I think there is a more fundamental problem uh, with this approach because it wrongly identifies moral personhood with moral agency. But when we talk about moral personhood, we are not only concerned about the responsibility of a person for their actions, but also for the rights of a moral patient or someone who uh, undergoes moral actions. Yeah, especially in the case of uh, newborn babies or mentally disabled people, as I, I mentioned earlier. So uh, let's take a quick look at the, the, the last approach God mentioned. And unlike the, the previous one, uh, which uh, focus on the individual level. This one emphasizes the social context from which the concept of moral person emerges. Uh, I, I cite a passage from uh, uh, Austrian philosopher Kochberg. We may wonder if robots will remain machines or if they can become companions. Is not moral quality already implied in the very relation that has emerged here? For example, if an elderly person is already very attached to her pyro robot, as you can see in the picture, and regards it as a, a pet or baby, then what needs to be discussed is that relation rather than the moral standing of the robot. So according to this approach, it is not the case that first uh, there they are some atomic uh, individual persons separate from each other, then they interact with the, uh, each other to establish social relations. Rather the converse, first we have uh, uh, social connections between uh, uh, persons and uh, then we recognize the uh, basic rights of these persons and we ascribe moral responsibility to them as well. Uh, here I mentioned the two challenges for this approach. Uh, first one is about the unwelcome social exclusion. So when a, a, a social community 
doesn't like a special group of people because of uh, the color of their skin or, or, or some other characteristic. And these people will be excluded from the uh, social connections. And uh, yeah, I think most of people today will think that that's simply wrong. Uh, another more fundamental problem is the relativism. It seems that all social uh, uh, in, in, in all social decisions can be justified. Yeah, so I, I think I, I need to be quick now. And uh, so uh, after this brief review, I think there is an important future of the person that has been uh, uh, unjustly ignored in this debate. I mean the uniqueness of, uh, of a human person. Yeah, a person has a unique existence that cannot be replaced by anyone else. I think Jim Fang mentioned the wholeness of a person. That's a part of this uniqueness. To fully appreciate the practical implication of this uniqueness, uh, I think we need to go back to the conceptual history of the term person in the Middle Ages. Uh, I will go quickly here. And uh, uh, we start with Boethius. is an uh, important uh, philosopher linking ancient philosophy and the medieval philosopher. Uh, in one of his theological treatises, he introduced a, a classic definition of a person as an individual substance of rational nature. Many people cite this uh, a definition, but just emphasizing the rational nature, the part of rational nature, uh, especially in the second approach I mentioned earlier. But Poetius himself uh, uh, lays a strong emphasis on the individuality of person. I, I quote here, persons cannot anywhere be predicated of universal, but only of particulars and individuals. For there is no person of man as animal or a genus, particular persons are only said of Cicero, Plato, or other particular individuals. I think this is important for Boethius because unlike Plato, he does not think there is any form or idea of man or animal, as they are only particular individuals. This individuality condition helps Boethius identify person as a particular rational being that can subsist by itself. Uh, this idea is further developed uh, by a theologian in the 20, uh, 20th, 13th century, William of Oxford. He makes an even more explicit link of the independent existence of a person to its dignity or inherent uh, value from the fact of not relying on any higher form for its persistence, a person obtain its fundamental dignity that cannot be violated in any community. He even introduced a uh, definition of person in terms of dignity. Person is an uh, individual distinct by a property pertaining to dignity. So dignity is taken as something that can never be separated from the person, not even conceptually. And uh, then what can we learn from the medieval conception of personhood? I think one uh, idea is that a person subsists in its own right and does not rely on anything higher than herself, not even uh, uh, on God for these theologians. In other words, a person is by definition taken be, to be the only owner of his existence extending in time. So I think now we can uh, revise the first approach Gordon uh, mentioned earlier. It's not a human dignity approach. It's rather a personal dignity approach to moral personhood. Because here we are not talking about the, the membership of a natural species as a requirement for personhood. We are only talking about uh, the uniqueness of existence. 
the individual enjoys full moral status because she is given an independent existence that is unique to herself from the very beginning of her life. This existence cannot and should not be absorbed or replaced by another entity at all. I just cite uh, Helen Margate, the, famous, uh, the title of Helen Margate's famous painting, not to be reproduced. So the, the person's existence is so uh, intrinsic to herself that it cannot be reproduced in a mirror or simulated by a machine. So I think now we come back to the question I raised at the beginning and the answer seems to be clear now. Uh, I think for machines powered by AI are actually controlled uh, by computer programs. These programs are designed to function in the same manner in a given type of machine. It does not matter whether this program is run by this or by that particular machine. So for instance, when a self-driving car make a wrong decision because of its program, we, we will not only punish it or, or, or call back this specific model of machine, but we will call all type of, all models of the same type machine all the uh, all, all cars that using the same uh, program, because what matters here is just the type of the uh, the program, not the, the 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 token that carry out this type. And moreover, a machine does not have a personal life unique to itself. For a thinking machine's life or history can be digitalized as a, a digital personality. Jing Fang mentioned earlier, and saved and replicated on another machine. So in, in this slide, I think that we have to say that machines cannot be persons unless they can lead a unique, unrepeated life. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tenya. I'm sorry, was... I, I spent much of time, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's okay. That's okay, because we now still have plenty of time for discussion of your presentation and your, your arguments. Um, and then also even more time to connect it to some of the other things we've already said. Now, I've learned this much about today's session that uh, questions from the audience take a few minutes to come in. So. Um, I will take the opportunity to ask you one question. Now, it's very beautifully developed today, and I'm grateful for learning about um, some, some new theoretical ideas from the medieval philosophers that I was not aware of, which seemed to me to be indeed very useful. But when you apply it in the end, I wonder whether I agree with each of the two points, which we still see here on the slide. The first one I want to make a suggestion about. You say that um, machines will be of a certain type. They will function according to some computer program. And the way we know machines are produced, well, usually in such a way that uh, many of them will run on the same program, just like all of our computers now run on um, one of a few possible operating systems. That's the way you think about it. Now, it seems to me that there, there is a possibility of individuality such that if we agree that any machine that wants to stand a chance of gaining personhood needs to be able to learn. So we consider machine learning. And when we consider machine learning, what we are considering is a machine that can basically rewrite its own program. Mm -hmm. So now we can wonder whether it's possible that a 
particular machine should write its program in such a way, rewrite its program in such a way that we can expect that it will become more and more unique. And when I think about a machine that stands a chance of gaining personhood, again, I think of it as something um, that not only can learn, but also move around um, this world that has a physical uh, part to its being too. And then I suppose, if any one machine uh, can 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 only be in one place, so sorry for 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 any particular machine, it'll be unique in the sense that it will be in one place that only it can occupy at one and the same time. And if based on this uniqueness, it will rewrite its own program, then I think there's a there's a principle upon which we can develop the idea that these machines can learn, as it were, to run on individual unique programs. I, I hope I hope this idea is clear. So, so I'm not sure that I think even if all of the machines begin with the same type of program, they will forever um, run on the same type of program or not perhaps develop unique programs for themselves. Yeah. Thanks a lot for, for your question. And uh, I think, uh, yeah. Um, so so um, you are suggesting that if, uh, uh, especially taking into consideration of uh, machine learning, and uh, we can imagine that uh, uh, a machine can develop a specific uh, program that learned by itself or developed uh, or written by itself. And uh, uh, it will be unique to, to this machine. And uh, yeah, but um, to be honest, I'm not quite sure what will be our uh, reaction to the uh, to the existence of such a machine. On the one hand, uh, as you mentioned, probably at a given moment in our real world, there is only such a machine can have this specific program that it developed after known history of learning, after known process of learning. Yeah, that uh, yeah, in that sense, it's uh, obviously unique. Maybe uh, it's you. Uh, the uniqueness of uh, the program for the machine, probably more than other uh, personal uh, uh, personal qualities for a human person, because we also share many characters <laughs> uh, uh, in a similar way. So uh, yeah, but uh, on the other hand, uh, if we still believe that uh, we can trace back this uh, this specific uh, program uh, to its original design. If we still believe that there's uh, uh, um, another machine of the same model, of the same running the same original program will develop in the same way as this one, or it will be, it can do it in an, another possible world. And um, in that case, I think we may doubt we will re recognize this, uh, uh, this, this, uh, this machine as a unique machine. So I think uh, it, also, uh, it depends on our intuition when meeting such a machine and uh, yeah, if at that time, if people still believe that uh, at least uh, in principle, we can explain the whole uh, history or development of this machine, at least we think that uh, it, it, its life or, or its development is quite different from an ordinary human person. Because in our personal life, 
there are, there are always some elements that resist uh, explanation. And, but uh, we, yeah, we are many constituted by this inexplainable uh, uh, elements at, uh, at least uh, uh, it seems to me, yeah. Thanks very much. That, that's, that's very useful. Thank you so much for answering my, my question here. Now, I've got one from our audience, and I will read it out to you. In general, which types of beings merit moral concern? Does personhood matter the most in determining moral status? Presumably, a cognitively unimpaired adult human is a moral patient, and a computer is not. But what about someone in a persistent vegetative state comparing to a future thinking machine? Is it fair to consider only the personhood level of a being to judge its moral patienthood? That's the question. Yeah. Yeah, a, a difficult question because I know there are uh, a lot of debates on the relation between moral personhood and the moral status. So I I try to answer it in a in a safe way. <laughs> so I think most people believe that um, uh, moral personhood is uh, is a necessary condition for the full moral status if we can uh, distinguish different degrees of uh, moral status because uh, when, when we talk about the uh, moral status of uh, of a space specific type of being we are talking about uh, the moral reactions of uh, other members of the same com communities and especially in terms of rights and uh, responsibility, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, yeah, I think I, as, uh, as, as this question also mentions that um, normally we only think that a, a normal adult human being can enjoy full, uh, uh, full basic uh, rights and uh, especially uh, can only be held morally accountable for uh, his or her actions. Yeah, but uh, I think uh, as regards the specific case uh, he mentioned about the, the moral status of um, a person in a persistent vegetative state, yeah, I think that that person also, uh, yeah, also satisfies the basic requirement for uh, personhood, uh, at, at least uh, according to uh, my approach. I think um, because um, other members of the same com communities still recognize that such a person uh, in, enjoy some basic uh, human rights, including the right to life. And uh, only in, uh, uh, in some specific, uh, only when we are uh, fully, uh, only when we are uh, fully sure that this person cannot gain, uh, cannot uh, be, be back to normal state, and uh, uh, we can uh, decide whether uh, we can continue his or her life. Yeah, but in that case, uh, we think that this this person uh, has such a, a so right, not because she has some uh, some set of capacities. Uh, like uh, uh, rationality or autonomy I mentioned earlier, just sim simply because uh, we recognize that 
uh, he or she has such a unique uh, existence that cannot be re replaced by any others. So we should respect the rights related to them. Uh, but in regarding to thinking machine, as I, I mentioned uh, in, in my answer to Sebastian's questions, we are not quite sure we can uh, ascribe such uniqueness to these machines. If we can, certainly we, we, I think we should also give rights to them. But for the moment, I, I do not see this, uh, see this possible. Yeah, so that's my, my response. Okay. Thanks very much. I have one follow-up question for you, perhaps, if, if, if you allow me. Yeah, sure. Now, we've, we've talked about um, various theoretical issues today concerning the sorts of beings, the sorts of machines that we expect may be developed in future and perhaps the near future. And we have tried to balance between the science that we know is more or less mature, the engineering that people are trying out. And there's always a sense of real prediction in, in this kind of discussion. And you mentioned something in terms of real life prediction when it comes to the question of personhood, whether machines can be persons. You had a cute picture of some little robots raising their arms for the um, robot rights movement. And that is something um, that, that I've also thought about in fact, because it seems to me and this is perhaps similar to some issues I've mentioned earlier, that before we will have found out about the nature of personhood in the most general way, we will have to deal with these questions um, already. There will be uh, politicians that need to consider certain proposals regarding um, the legal framework for digital personalities and um, similar things. And so there will be people who for very practical reasons have to make these decisions, but they will have to make these decisions on the basis of um, uncertain science and philosophy. Now, you said a little bit about what you expect to happen, but I, but I want to, to ask again, um, I know that you have your own developed views of um, what the correct view would seem to be. Of course, being a seasoned, very experienced professor of philosophy, you know that um, most of the time when we develop these views, it so happens that many people disagree. And it is of course the case here. You've shown us that many people have developed different views. And so have you thought about what you expect to happen? Do you expect that the legal frameworks around the world are going to be developed so that robots or machines in general will sooner or later be given um, the person status, the moral person status, or, or do you think that that is not going to happen? Have you, have you thought about, about what, what it is that people are perhaps most likely to believe about um, this question, even if they do not know the truth? Yeah, I, I thought about it, but I, I do not have uh, have a fixed answer yet. So I actually I'm still thinking about, about it. I I think in the near future, um, it will not happen that um, we will uh, recognize uh, the rights of uh, 
of uh, robots or, or thinking machines, at least we will not um, think that they enjoy uh, full rights as human beings do now. Yeah, but probably we may think about uh, protect uh, protect some uh, intelligent machines like we protect uh, um, some animals, especially pets. Yes, because uh, yeah, I now uh, I, as uh, the last question mentions that um, we need to to make a distinction between moral status and uh, moral personhood, and some. Uh, entities can enjoy moral status, but they are not necessarily uh, uh, persons. They can enjoy, uh, they can have some uh, some moral, con they deserve some moral considerations lower than, than persons. Yeah, because uh, we think that, they, for instance, we think uh, animals can experience pleasure and pain. And uh, when we, so we need to treat them in a very special way, unlike we treat uh, inanimate things. So if, uh, if, 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 for instance, if uh, uh, a thinking machine like a parallel can, um, can, um, can interact uh, emotionally with uh, its uh, consumers, so we need to be very careful uh, about our uh, way of dealing with this sort of uh, uh, of machines, uh, especially care robots, as you mentioned, they have intimate connections with human beings. Uh, they, are, they are very important parts of these people's life. So I, I do not say they, they will become persons like their users, but anyway, they still deserve a serious uh, moral and uh, legal considerations and they need to be protected uh, in a very specific way. I, I think that that's something more likely to, to happen in, in the near future. Yeah. Yes, I don't thank think you very much. Yeah. Thank, th thanks very much, Tian Yu. Now, I, th I think you're absolutely right in this distinction certainly seems, seems very useful here because it seems possible that um, when the relevant um, frameworks are going to be developed in detail that this uncertainty that surely everyone must feel, including the risk of what may happen if we make a wrong decision in this um, uncertain field, must make people want to draw distinctions such as the one that you have suggested. And I think that's a very useful suggestion. So I think, we have come um, to an end already, uh, given that that we we had given ourselves two hours today. So I want to thank again our panelists, our present presenters tonight, uh, Professor Wu Tianyu and also Dr. Hao Jingfang for their presentations, and I want to thank our audience too for the very inspiring questions that they have shared with us. And I hope that this was useful to, to everyone, certainly was for me. So thanks again and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.